continue to just keep the passion flowing. How are you? You mean like the Pecky Cypress? That's blasphemy. Pecky Cypresses. That's like that's to be honored, bowed before. <laughs> see, see, it's rare. It's rare. It's special. Almost as special as you. There's only one of you, huh? You have mounted your TV to the wall. Yeah. A trophy case? Oh, I remember y'all taking them. No, I don't have enough trophies to put in it. I'd have to go. I'd have to go buy fake trophies just to put in there. So I'm looking for them. I'm trophyless. I'm just gonna come hug you. <laughs> Murdered that bear and made this blanket out of him. So 
Yeah. I don't want to trade places with your weekend. Like yesterday, I'd rather have been where I was than where you were. I'm quite confident. How's your back? Knees? You're a monster. You built different. You different. <laughs> okay. How's your back? <laughs> How's Caleb? <laughs> yeah. Huh? Oh, well, well, it happens. All right. We're like almost, you know, eight minutes late here this morning because we're visiting. That's all right. That's a good thing. Anything we need to make mention of before we kick off? Huh? Huh? Welcome. Welcome. I, is that a granddaughter? Miss Collin? Grand, thanks for doing that. Ah, I didn't, I didn't see. Okay. Well, your husband stepped out of the truck and I asked him where the pretty one was. And, uh, then he gave me a piece of candy and said, here, we need to sweeten you up a little bit. You're being all cantankerous already there early this morning. But I just wanted him to know. You know, he needs to be reminded he ain't the pretty one every once in a while, right? All right. Good. Good. Well, I appreciate you bringing them grand youngins. Speaking of grand youngins, we haven't closed on the house, right? It just got inspected? Okay. End of this month, but looking good? All right. So then first of the month, that means they're moving? You got your dolly prepared, Mr. Bill? How's your back feeling? You might need to yeah, you might need to work out the next couple of days, just stay good and limbered up. Maybe see a chiropractor, get a massage, and then yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you watch the little so they can do all the heavy lifting. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I don't know. I might take the heavy lifting. <laughs> Just say, <laughs> I don't know. All right. I've not done anything about my armadillos in case anybody's curious, but I've been researching some more. All right. So just so you know, stay tuned. Stay tuned. If armadillos get murdered, you know, I will be rejoicing. I've been studying in precatory psalms, you know, the, the zap them kind of Lord to kind of get me in the right frame. Indignation is kind of where I'm at with armadillos. So. Y'all need to know my state of mind this morning. There you go. How are you, sir? Low back problems, low back problems. Laying floor. Anybody want to volunteer? What the, is it all done? Can I even get volunteers now? It's too late? Oh, well, never mind. Well, that's a perfect. Anybody want to volunteer to help them lay floor? Oh, I, oh it's done. Uh, huh? Just like a blister. Tur turn up after the work. That's our special. Power slaughter, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. Showing up after the work's done. I'm looking at you. Now you have to show up when the work has to be done. That's the nature of your new job. All right. Family, it's good to see you. Y'all ready to crack open some Colossians this morning and see what we can find? Before we get rolling, Mark, can I pick on you to, to lead us in a word of prayer before we get started? Let's all pray. Lord, we thank you for this day that you come out and through your word and learn more about the plan that you have for each of us. Lord, just ask that you be with all those teachers this morning as they carry lessons, bring healing to people, take these lessons and apply them to our lives. Lord, we just ask that you go on through it throughout this uh, hour of working. <laughs> Everyone has kind of prepared and focus on you. Lord, just thank you for everything that you do each and every day. Lord, be with all those who are sick and on our prayer list. Lord, just guide them, put your hand upon them, and heal them and see thy will. Lord, we just, once again, we just thank you for all the many blessings that you give us. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so. Romans 8 is my favorite chapter of the Bible, right? Favorite chapter. If you had to guess what my favorite book of the Bible is, you have a guess? 
No, it's not Colossians. Well, no, that's like that's current. That's current. What did you say? Ephesians. Yeah, and if Daniel Wentworth was here, he would tell you Ephesians because he's heard me preach my Ephesians overview sermon about six times, at least six times. Ephesians is my favorite book, probably. I just love the way it breaks down. Well, Colossians is like the book of Ephesians' pretty sister. You know what I mean? Like, not quite as pretty to me as Ephesians, because like Ephesians the favorite, but but Colossians is like the sister book, almost as pretty, almost as pretty. Written at the same time, a lot of the same reason. That's kind of what we're going to jump off to uh, in our Sunday mornings, and it, it takes us what it takes us. But that's kind of what I want us to look at together. What I'd encourage you to do is in, in between time, when you got time, you can probably read through the entire book and it not take you a whole long, long lot of time. Like if you're just literally reading this to finish, 20, 30 minutes tops. You know, if you're reading to kind of dig maybe a little bit longer, but it doesn't take long to read through the book. And I'd encourage you to, to, to get the whole thing, the whole enchilada. When you get chances to do that, do that. It, it would be good. Um, but I want that's where I kind of want us to talk about because it, it jives with some other stuff that we've been we've been talking about. Now, this breakdown is kind of one of my favorite ways to study, especially New Testament books, uh, where we know some of these details. It's kind of the way that I break it down. And so every time I study, you tell me, hey, we're studying chapter one, one through seven today or one through eight today. Then this is the set of questions that I'm going to come and ask the section I'm reading. Like I'll come read the section we're supposed to read. And then my personal studies, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask the word these questions and try to find answers. Does that make sense? Let me, let me give you an example. So as I approach the book of Colossians, who's the author? That's question number one. Who, who wrote the book of Colossians? Paul, we're pretty, pretty secure. Now I don't want to just know that. Let me see if I can dig a little bit further. What more do I know about the author? Do you know possibly what's going on in his life? when he wrote the book of Colossians. He's in prison. Do you know why he's in prison? Now we're digging a little deeper. It is one of the what we call the prison epistles. So is Ephesians, so is Colossians. He's in prison, you're exactly right. Let's dig about why he's there. Think of like the end, like the, the chapter 21 and 2-ish of Acts. Preaching that God's mercy was for the Gentiles. Okay. Y'all remember like where he's, he's Acts 21, Acts 22 ish. He's brought the, the gift that's been, you know, all the contributions have been made. Thank first Corinthians here. And he's finally got to Jerusalem to, to deliver that gift. And he's walking around in the temple and there's a stir because there's an assumption made because he was seen with a fella earlier now there's an assumption made that what maybe violation has Paul committed in the temple complex? You, you brought a Gentile in here. Remember we talked about the, how the temple courts were set up? You had a court of Gentiles. They could get somewhat near the door outside, but not all. Then you had a court of women for Israelite women, and then you had the court of Israel, which was for, for the Jewish men. And so there's this, he's brought a Gentile in here. All right, and there's there's stirring up. There's so much depth behind this. There was a pact made by some brethren in Thessalonica, not brethren, excuse me, by some Jews in Thessalonica. You remember what that pact? Kevin and Wes are nodding their heads. Remember what that pact was? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're after. Well, he has to flee. I'm, I'm getting my two stories. I'm getting my two stories. That's when he's on his way to Rome, where they make the pact. We're gonna. Let God kill us if we don't kill him. That's later. Thessalonica is where he has to get ran out of. And then he finds people that are more noble minded in Berea because he's converted. people. He's upsetting the apple cart and he's got to be snuck away to, and run away to another city. Those people have followed him all the way to Jerusalem on his heels. Those Jews have followed because he's preaching that Gentiles are included. Well, the, the, he's being harmed by the mob. Acts 21 kind of tells you that, that the guards have to carry Paul because of the violence done to him by the mob. And as he, they're toting him kind of out of there, removing him, he begs the officer, let me speak to them. Remember what language he speaks to him in? And they're in Hebrew. And so, oh, it kind of causes 
And so he starts addressing them and basically tells his conversion story. And they're listening to him tell about, hey, this is why I did it. Hey, you know, I was one of you and I used to do this and I used to do this. And then he talks about a conversation he had with God himself. Where, where, where basically he's God, let me speak to them. They'll listen to me like talking to Jewish people. And God says, no, depart for I send you to the Gentile. And at that word, they bum rush Paul and the guard and they got to rush him out of there. That's what starts this process of why he's in jail because he is dared say, just by the way, Ephesians and Colossians, whenever you see the word mystery, part of what the mystery is all about is that Gentiles are part of God's plan, that this is for whosoever will may come. That's all part of the underlying what's going on here. So that's what we know about the author. Where is he at? He's sitting in jail. Why is he in jail? For preaching the gospel, specifically because he said Gentiles can be included, right? So that's what we know a little bit about the author. Now, the audience might be a little, you know, maybe less known than obviously Paul's a pretty well, well-known well character. Would you know anything at all about the brethren that he's writing to? Even if you don't know like specific facts, think about the conversation we just had. What might be the demographic of the group? Why would you kind of maybe lean that way? Well, because that's going to be part of what he includes in here is that this mystery is that you guys have been, been part of this all along. You know, Paul's gone on these missionary journeys. He's gone a lot of people. I don't believe that he ever got to go to Colossae. I think, you know, he's written to other people. He knows him. But there's a couple of nuggets here that we can kind of just look at in chapter one. Look at, let's, let's just read together one through one through eight. One through it to kind of give you a little flavor about maybe he hasn't um, been in this area maybe as long uh, as as other places. Mr. Vaughn, do you mind reading that for us this morning? One through one through eight. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints which are in Colossae, grace, peace, and love from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard is the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love and spirit. So, kind of, does it sound like firsthand, like I was there? I, like, there's other places where he talks about as my children, and I was there. Like, we know, you know, with the Corinthians, he was there in person, and then even plans a second trip. The, the nature of what he said here in the section you just read is kind of, how is it different than... Hey, you know, you're mine, you're my children, I know you intimately. What does he kind of, what are some words that jump out to you that maybe suggest his relationship? Has he met him in person, do you think? I've heard about it. I've heard about it. And even mentions the, uh, the brother E's name. Epaphras maybe is the pronunciation of that. What does it say about him? You learn from him some, some certain things. Our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister, on your behalf. So it's maybe that this is the brother that has kind of maybe started the work, started the church um, that, that's going on in, in this area. Um, something else that, that, that may or may not be true, but but people believe that the book of Philemon, you remember, I know I'm digging deep, we're unprepared here. Book of Philemon is about a brother that what kind of situation is going on with Philemon? Do you remember that? The bond servant that left. Well, Epaphras. Onesimus, Onesimus is his name. Onesimus. Onesimus is his name. Left. That's right. And Paul was sending him back to him. Okay. We believe that Philemon worshipped at Colossae. It's 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 believed that that's so that that might be some other details of what we have here. To your point about them possibly being a heavily Gentile makeup. 
very similar to the way it's worded in the book of Ephesians, but in verse 21 of chapter 1, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless. You once were exiled or away or distant from the people of God. Some other things are going to kind of hint at that, that as well. But that's some of the stuff that we know about. Okay, he's writing to people that, well, if, if Patras is a, is a minister on their behalf, then they're brethren. He's writing to brethren that are in this town of Colossae, probably majority Gentile. They've got a brother that's done some work. But similar to what he has to do in Ephesians, there's some outside pressures going on. What would you know about what's going on just in life in general in this day and time when Paul's writing this, maybe in like the 50s and 60s AD? I mean, uh, what, what region are we even talking about? Who's in control? Who's in power? What do you know about them? That all helps us understand better the audience that he's writing to. Okay. So you're talking about like possibly like like the, the Jewish people that are in that area and some sy we know synagogues have caused him problems. A lot of times that's the first place he goes, but then some of them don't always accept the message, and so that creates pressure for anybody that's that's got that's got that. What well, even outside of that, what else like maybe national wise, like who's in control that way? We got Roman control. And some, you know any details about how what that looks like for people? What's coming in a couple of years? I mean, if this is 80, 50s, and 60s, what's coming in not very long? Didn't we talk about that recently in the class? 80, 70s, like not long out. There's already some pressure between the, what's going on with the Jews and Rome. For a while, Christians kind of get under that umbrella, and then they get specifically targeted by, remember what emperor kind of really goes after the Christians? The first guy to really do that? Nero specifically targets them, all comes down to what it's believed is he wanted to rebuild another part of the city. He didn't get to do what he wanted to do, so he sets it on fire, and it was kind of some rumors that he did it his own self. He blames it conveniently on, which kind of ramps up some pressure for them. All of this is kind of in other passages of scripture, the, the, the dispersion of, of Christians, like where they kind of have to leave their, they're, they're leaving all different kinds of places. And so all of this is, is in the realm of what life is like for these people. There's going to be some pressure to be Christians, whether they're Jews or they're Gentiles. And now they're claiming Christ following they're, They've got Jews that have been converted to Christ that aren't still totally over their Judaism. Does that come up at all in New Testament? Is that, a, is that a battle of misunderstanding about, well, are these Gentiles even totally in? Because we still got to hang up about what particular item or discussion. It's a big deal. Are we in? Do we have to have them do this to be able to come in? Now, is that totally, I mean, or just we, we got to be careful about just totally misunderstanding the Jews. That was the entry point. And they understood what it meant to be a proselyte. Like you Gentiles could become an accepted by Jews. Now, not all the way accepted, but you could at least get on the bandwagon as long as you submitted to that. Think Acts 15, where they got a big discussion about, hey, Paul is converting a lot of Gentiles. What do we do with them? Right? The book of Galatians features that concept heavily. Are they in or not? I know I'm going probably way deeper than we need to, but you need, the, the more I understand who's writing the letter and who he's writing it to, before I start breaking down the minutia, I want to know who he is and what's going on in his life. So he's been arrested for preaching to Gentiles, and he's writing to people who are predominantly Gentiles, and they've got pressure in their life. They've got pressure from, from a national standpoint of Rome. They've got pressure from Jews who aren't happy that conversions are taking place. They've got converted Jewish now that are now brethren who still are not sure, can I fully embrace you or not with the way that you are? That's what's going on in these people's lives. So they've got inside church confusion about how do we even see and relate to one another. You've got Jewish pressure. You've got Gentile pressure. You've got national pressure. You've got your own Gentile people. That, what do you mean you only have one God? 
What do you mean you can't go to these, these festivals and feasts and this meat that's been sacrificed? What do you mean you can't go to the places you used to go and do something? That's Just insert here. Is that totally outside the realm of sometimes when we became Christians? Did all of your friends understand why you did what you did when you became a Christian? You remember being like, I mean, if it's at all, I'm just going to guess, but like when you understood and accepted Jesus for who he was and decided to get baptized for the remission of your sins and become a child of God, that's a profound moment in people's lives. What's sometimes difficult to process, and I think a work of Satan is, is when you go to school or when you go to work the next day, why isn't everybody as excited as you are? And it can be a little bit of like, Poor, like, man, here you are, and this has been a, what you believe and understand is a crescendo moment of your life. And for the people around you, it's just kind of like, man. Or if it's not even some, it may even be worse than that. That your conversion may be rubbing people the wrong way. Or because, you know, them hearing about that for you, just being a hater, like, you know, well, you think you're better than me now? You know, you get off it. Does pressure happen when we become Christians too? So one of the big purposes, if I would say there's a massive message, now we're kind of the purpose of the whole enchilada, is to see Jesus for who he is. One thing that'll help a guy that's sitting in jail for preaching the master's message, the whole message, and one thing that'll help a lot to people who are in the environment, in the, in the world scenario that we've just talked about with pressures that abound from all, one thing you can cut through all of that is to point their eyes to who? To Jesus. And specifically, that he reigns supreme. If I would say that there is a big kind of, and this is not, this is why Colossians and Ephesians are so similar. Those of you that have heard me teach on Ephesians, one through three of Ephesians, Paul has one point see Jesus. And he magnifies and glorifies him in a lot of different ways in those first three chapters. But he says, I want you to see him with the eyes of your heart. I want you to, he prays that they be filled up with all the fullness of God to, to know the height, the depth, and light, to just be blown away by all that Jesus is and has done. For Chapter one in Ephesians, this is verses three through 14, is one long run on sentence that in him you have every spiritual blessing. You've been adopted and you've been forgiven and you've been redeemed and you've been given all. I mean, he just praises all these blessings we have in Christ. That's one through three of Ephesians. Colossians, the first few chapters, is going to be very similar. We're going to do a whole lot of looking at just who is Jesus. Well, he's the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the head of the church. He's King Jesus. He's reign supreme. In him, all the fullness of God dwells in bodily form, Jesus. Does that help you regain your center when you're dealing with what Paul and his audience are dealing with? That we're almost going to jump out of the gates and say, with all the pressure you've got going on, let's just remember who Jesus is. Now, what's also kind of cool about it is, is they know that a little bit. I mean, they're Christians. He's writing to Christians. They've accepted Brother Epaphras has done a good job of starting a church there and, and, and converting people. And he's going to praise them for what he's heard about, the stance that they're taking and the love that they have. and the whole, So they know that. Do you ever need a reminder of who Jesus is? To cut through some of the same stuff that, you know, so that's what we got going on. Is that relatable to you? I mean, oh, this is a book that was written... You know, 2,000 years before me, what has it got to do with me? Why do we study? Let me just take a quick detour. Why do we study scripture, people, that is so old? Why are you here? And why are you, even when you're away from here, digging into an ancient document? These are ancient words. What good does that, how, how relatable is any of this to you? Lest we forget, all right? Same Savior. Same Savior. Ooh, that's a good point. Anything else about why we would go to this? It's still true and it's still relevant. True this time. Is people are people. people. People were busy then. Don't think that we're more... Be an agricultural society and tell me about busyness. That relate to you at all, Wes? Like agricultural people just have all... Farmers have all kinds of time on their hands, right? There's nothing to be done every day, right? Like, and there's never any like 
things that would make like there's no emergencies. You don't ever have to skip Bible class to go put a cow back in the fence, right? That never happens. That literally happened a couple of Sundays ago. To, uh, you know, they were busy too. They had pressure too. I mean, sometimes I mean I understand the world and we frustrated with our government at times, whatever. Yet our government's not targeting us. We're not being you know, set on fire and pitched to crosses. And yet they understood pressure. They understood busy. They understood family, not understanding your relationship with Jesus Christ. Same people, kind of people, same circumstances, similar. No, it's not modern. We've got specific child. They didn't have cell phones they had to deal with. Right. But they had issues that they dealt with. But it's people are people. Truth is truth. Jesus is Jesus. The message to come to him, the same offering that it goes to everybody is just as needed today as it was when it was first preached, that the gospel truly is for all. So that's kind of going to be what the purpose is. That's the, to me, the purpose is, is going to be to see Jesus for who he is. And then very similar to the book of Ephesians, he's going to have a lot of them. Okay, if you've seen that, here's some, here's some commands or encouragement about then what your life needs to look like if you've seen it. If you really believe he's King Jesus, then how does that affect how you're going to walk and how you're going to live and how you're going to treat people and how you're going to endure some of the persecutions and pressures that you've got facing? you? So that's the message. That's the that's the big purpose message, which I hope is grabbing all to you this morning. Man, that's us. I need that. What you, I hope that you're saying this morning is, man, I need the book of Colossians. I might want to go home this afternoon or sometime this week and read through about who and who Jesus is and how supreme he is and what place he has and then how that has an effect on my life. That's the beauty of this study, brother. You can read you can read the book of, of Colossians, you know, on your lunch break and kind of get a picture of it. And then we'll come in here together and break down parts of it. And we'll all have something to share about how it related to what we've going on, got going on in our own life. All right, so that's kind of how we're going to break it down. Now, purpose of the section would be, and this is where it'll be a little bit tougher, but let's just say like, hey, we're going to try to cover verses one through eight. Well, then what I want you to do is go, all right, and hopefully, you know, this is going to get a whole lot faster to answer these questions because we're answering them together. You already know who the author is and what he's dealing with. You already know who the audience is. You kind of know what the big picture is. Now, how does this section add to that? What does it tell me about the author? What does it tell me about the audience? What, how does what he writes in verses 1 through 8 tie into the big picture message? We want to hang whatever. As we break down the trees that are in the forest, you want to attach the tree to the forest. Well, if we know what the big picture is, then how does this section add to that? And then the last thing, because what good is studying the Bible? What I want you looking for, the last thing is, what do I need to do with it? How does that help me? How does that apply to my life? And that's what I mean, I'd love if you guys would read like, hey, how do I prepare for class on Sunday? Well, no, you may not know exactly where we are or how far we're going to get, but you study chapter one, you study chapter two, you go and pencil some of these questions and your own answers down, bring your own applications. And then when I get to class, you know, next Sundays and be like, all right, let's let's read verses one through eight again. Tell me what you got, man. What did you find? What questions did you ask the text? How did it answer to you? What applications did you find? What grabbed a hold of you? And now we all got something we contribute to the study because you guys know that's my favorite way. Instead of just one guy looking at something, it's all of us looking at it together. All right? So with all of that, and any other thoughts, questions, kind of whatever, before I kind of jump into any a little bit of the, the trees this morning, I just kind of wanted to lay some of that groundwork. Helpful at all? Before, I mean, before you turn to Colossians 1, verse 1, it kind of, what are we dealing with? Well, let's just see. Let's just see. Got to go to my digital Bible where I got all my color coding. All right, so he introduces himself. Who is Paul, according to chapter 1 and verse 1? He is an apostle. What's an apostle? A messenger. Absolutely a messenger. Does, does it carry a little bit even more depth, though, than, I mean, I know you didn't, I'm just, I'm, I'm digging, I'm digging on purpose. Is an apostle, it's a messenger, but is it more than just a messenger? Would you, any other words or concepts you would add to that? Before Paul, 
it was somebody who had been there at the beginning. Okay. And that's why he refers to himself as someone born out of due season. You know what he's check tracking with? In order to be the, the, the first apostles, what was one of the requirements? Remember when they're having to re replace Judas in the book of Acts and they got some qualifications we had to meet? There was a, what, what were they? You had to be an eyewitness. Is that what you said too? And so Paul kind of, some people even questioned his apostleship. Well, when did, when did Paul see Jesus? I love that you guys know that. I mean, like he saw him. But he talks about one born out of due season. And, and, and we didn't really go into this depth. But let's, let's even just tie Paul's personal background to the message he's now preaching. Does that add any does that add any color? He seems to change. He changed. And everybody hates change. That's the biggest problem with this whole stereo is you've got to change. If I could like take a picture frame and frame a comment. Because everything about coming to Christ at the end of the day, it's all about change. Unless you're already the image of Jesus. Anybody say that? Are you already the image of Jesus? Anybody else Jesus here? That I somehow we missed that you were the Messiah. Right? If that's not you, then what that means for every single one of us is that what is required is some change. And we resist it. That's going to tie right into our sermon this morning. It's, I mean, it's perfect. And so one of the things that gives a lot of credibility to Paul's message have you seen a change? I got. Paul is the epitome of never say never. Okay. Well, yeah, you know, I, we got we got to peel back some more layers for that. What do you dig deeper on that? When you make a comment about you know somebody will never change, how many times have we heard that? You look at Paul's life, and then early, and then now look at pre-road to Damascus on the outside looking in. Would you have ever said, well, that guy's a future kingdom leader? That guy's going to write two-thirds of our New Testament. You think anybody's calling that shot? Never. Never. Hated the way. Held the jackets while the fellow was being stoned to death. This is not... He's committed. He's all the way in. Yeah, maybe he didn't chunk a rock, but he's giving hearty, hearty approval to those who were. A prophet that's in your Bible lost his life, and this dude was there. An accomplice. And then the Lord meets him. And it's very similar to the heart of David. When Nathan tells him that story. Right? And now David's upset. And thou art the man. And very similar to Paul's life. And Paul almost never gets over that. I am a sinner. Chief of sinners. When he talks about like parts that he writes about, I am a debtor. You know, I, you know, and being adopted now. And so as you're writing to people whose lives are all about change, and it's one thing, change is difficult anyway, but now we have to do change that adds pressure to your life. How many times do we, do we change? Usually if we're going to make a change in business or we're going to make a change in like our daily routine or with our kids, usually we change things to simplify to make things easier. Now we're making changes that actually make your life more difficult. Now I can't laugh. Don't fit in. You're not going to fit in. You're going to have a target on your back. And now I don't get a lash out when I feel like it. I don't get a stomp a mud hole in people when they deserve it. And I have to let other people in when they put their blinker on or even sometimes when they don't put their blinker on. Because, you know, it just <laughs> kindness and how I react to people and how I relate to people and all this change is actually more difficult on the front end. Mr. Joe. I think the student has more than that to do in the church itself where people are so reluctant to ask for help and matters of spiritual things that are they're having difficulties simply because they don't want to be the sponge that stands out wrong and everybody wants to be and says, I knew this was going to happen to you. That's right. It makes us a much weaker person. It makes us a less faithful person. It makes us less dependable, depending, dependent on the Lord. Yeah, I was reading an article about just like 
the, the article was more about young women, but about how they suffer in silence. Talking about in the church, because they, they, they don't want people to know. Either there's a shame or an embarrassment on the front end, or as soon as you let somebody know that I've got a struggle that I'm working on, then you're setting yourself up for the I told you so's or the, you know, I, I think that's part of why God even wants us to confess. Like if I go to Joe and I say, hey, Joe, I'm really struggling with it. pick us in. And I and I let Joe and I, Joe pray for me about that. By my goal, I'm actually probably asking you, hey, I want you to check in on me about this. And whether it's in a week or it's a month, whatever. And if I know that in a month's time, Joe's going to come around and not in a dogmatic or overly just, hey, how you doing with that? If I haven't done very well with it, how's that meeting go? I might, when I see Joe coming around, do what? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm a, Joe, I know I, want, I need to talk to this brother today because <laughs> I'm, I'm going to avoid that, that accountability. that, And all he means it out of love is just because I, I invited you in. So that's what we do, Joe. I won't even invite you in or let you know about my struggle because I don't. I, I think there's so many dynamics that sometimes I maybe don't want that pressure. There's egg on my face if I fail. There's egg on my face. There's shame and embarrassment if I tell Joe I'm struggling and then I mess up again. The truth is, if you don't struggle, if you don't have egg on your face, you don't need the Lord. Amen. This is where we miss it. We don't recognize how dependent we are because we base it on ourselves and not upon Him. Or just if I need to be shiny and never have anything to have egg on my face, then I water down really what being a Christian is. And then I just I conveniently ignore the parts that don't make me look and feel like I want it. Just this jumps all over them. Seeing Paul for who he was and how he saw himself in his abs. I'll tell you another side effect of what you're talking about. Paul had a I mean, a vivid appreciation and desperate need for God's grace because Paul knew how ugly he was. When we shine ourselves up and I don't want egg on my face, then that you see how that takes away from a desperate need. I don't need God's grace. I'm pretty clean. Honest with ourselves. Honest with ourselves. And so hopefully when we see King Jesus, pure Jesus, then it, cuts through some of the facade that we've done or some of the walls we build up to protect our own image and protect our own pride and minimize our shame and egg on our face. Hopefully it'll cut through that and knock all that down because only then will our hearts see him for who he is. One of the places where my brain goes is when people got to see the taste. You, nobody can look on God and live, but when they got a peek at it, when God's presence filled that temple or even the tabernacle, was it clear holy versus unholy by those who draw near to me i will be regarded i mean was there any question in the pure spirit presence of god what holy and unholy was what's 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 moses do when he sees a bush on fire what's he do i, I see a couple things what's he do he's drawn to it which is that's good that's right Shoes off, face down. Same guy gets a peek at the, the wake of God's glory when he hides him in a rock and his face glows. When people came to the mountain, clearly picture he's God, I'm not. He's holy, I'm not. It didn't even take seeing God. When John the Revelator saw a holy angel what did he do? And it's not even God. It's just an angel, a representative, a messenger. What did he do? Woo! And don't do that. I'm not even him. I'm not even the guy. I work for the guy. Absolutely. It's too much. So all that, and, and my, all of those pictures to me is, 
is when I, if I will open the eyes of my heart to see Jesus for who and all that he is, not just Savior Jesus, not just Lamb Jesus, but Lion Jesus, King Jesus, God Jesus, hopefully it will cut through and tenderize and break down some of the things that I've been guarding and hiding. And the only, the only reason why Jesus wants to destroy that is so he can come in and take up even more room. And so you can be, we need to, we got some temple cleaning we need to do. Holy Spirit wants to reside and be, a, let this be a temple. And we need to clear out as much as we can of our temple so he can take up as much space as he humanly can, divinely can. All right, I'm going to stop there. So we kind of, that was more introductory. I would guess we're probably going to do one through 10 ish. Maybe, maybe one through 18-ish. I mean, that's where I can't promise you exactly because I kind of want to give freedom for the Spirit to work on us how we need and not tie ourselves down to a specific. But as you prepare for next Sunday, I don't. I definitely don't think we get any farther than the first 18 verses. We may not even get that far. I don't know how good the discussion is. So go read with this in mind. Ask these questions to the text. Ask these questions or consider these and then jot down answers. How does... This, what he says in 1 through 18, add to the message. How does it help the audience? How is Paul a reflection of some of these verses? And then most importantly, what do I need to do with that? It might just be need, I need to say, wow. It, you know what I mean? It's just whatever, what, how, how can I apply this to me and make me more like Jesus having read it and studied it? That's how we're, we'll prepare for Sundays. So I hope that you come with a, with a tablet or a, whether it's digital or handwritten, where you've been jotting down some, here's your frame, A-A-P-P-A, and write down your answers to your questions. And that's how we'll study together, together next Sunday. All right.